In this episode of Detroit Performs, an artist develops art projects that strengthen and beautify communities, finding inspiration in an unlikely place, and the calming effect of art. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and today I'm at Habitat Galleries in Royal Oak. Now we'll learn more about the galleries later in the show, but first I want to introduce you to artist Donna Jackson, whose bodies of work are the result of what she learned from womanhood and what she wants to share from her hometown. I never saw myself as a person that was an artist to create art for others to enjoy. That wasn't the point. The point was for me to get to know who I was. I was in Houston from 05 to 2010. I was hearing so much about the insurgence and the change of Detroit. And I was seeing all these different faces of who's doing this, these transitions and all that. And none of them looked like me or my friends or, or my neighborhood, none of it. Like, I need to create something to make sure people, these voices that I know that are there are, can be heard, seen, and people are aware of it. And that's what I started doing as project manager. I wanted to reach out to other artists. Door of Opportunity is a transition of physical doors into art. And I wanted to make sure that the collection we got was this really good mix of what was really going on in Detroit with artists. With these doors, you can do a few things. You get a voice, you get your artwork in the communities where it truly, truly matters. And then you also get to engage with other artists that may feel the same way that you do. Today, we're installing uh, Doors of Opportunity in Bates Academy. I love that it is a school and a system that I grew up in. And being able to do that and bring art to that school is, is, is really exciting. It is a process, and it's one we had to learn. We learned that we needed team members, we needed movers, we needed people that understood the delicacy of art. The theme was uh, Detroit. We all really do see this city in a different way, so it's so important to uh, give someone that chance to show that. We always go to diversity, meaning skin color or gender. No, I mean, thought process and experience diversifies us, right? And we need to really give that more power or value it more, and I think that's what I try to do with my projects. What I hope the students get from the installation is knowing that you can make a career out of being an artist, that art is something that should be a normal part of your everyday life and space, and seeing art made by people that are from the same city as you and most likely look like you. you know, I think those are important. I think people see me more as that person that develops projects that supports exhibits and support other artists and i'm good with that title it's not until you really get to know me that i may share my art my personal art colorful women is my personal art series 
that I have been doing since 2005. I am very good at being a human being. <laughs> I am very good at being a spiritual being. I am eh, in, 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 about being a woman. It's, it's one of those kind of weaknesses that I have that I'm trying to work on, being comfortable in my skin as a woman. And I have nieces and nephews and, and I want them to be comfortable in their skin in that same way, whether they're male, female, or whatever they're feeling. I started drawing women, kind of deconstructing them from what the standard beauties is for America and constructing it in a way that was more digestible for me. I almost think I'm trying to make the physical woman into a spiritual one by the way I draw. And the funny thing is I called it colorful women, but when I first started, I only drew in black and white because color scared the hell out of me. But as I continue, you know, I think art calls you and tells you what to do. And so the colors start kind of just phasing into it. I started seeing small sentences just occurring in my illustrations. And then it went from small sentences to like paragraphs, like, oh, maybe I need to, you know, look into just sitting and writing uh, and seeing what that feels like. A lot of time the inspiration to write is listening to other people, their stories of being women, our own experiences in the neighborhood, experience with family, pretty much. Anything could spark that inspiration. It is a lifestyle of doing something creative every day. You can learn more about Donna Jackson as well as all the artists that we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Next up, Grant Chu creates his latest artwork with an appreciation of nature from a very rare and unique perspective. I wouldn't say that I create things or paint or whatever because I am might be a little shy or socially awkward or whatever you want to call it. I do these things to try and figure things out for myself. Uh, a lot of my practice is about me experimenting and trying to figure things out about the world around me. At 17, my, my graduating year of high school, uh, that summer I was, uh, due to a series of terrible events, I'm not, I won't get into now, but uh, I was incarcerated up until I was in my late 20s. So it was about nine and a half years. And uh, throughout that time, I, I tried to keep up what I could, uh, you know, that that's, very, that's a very transformative experience. So, you know, when you, you can't, for me personally, it's hard to see the world in the same, with the same eyes. When you're inside, you have, obviously there's a lot of time to think about things. Um, while you're there, when you're there, uh, when you get out, uh, what you're mainly for me it was when I get out. You know, it's kind of a very long daydream of mine every day. It was what what do I do when I get out of here? Um, a lot of a lot of time to, to meditate on things, and in so doing, I tried to figure out what was important for me. Uh, it's kind of a self discovery thing, and how I relate to my external world outside of me and how that might come back in uh, and relate back into me on, on a deeper level. Um, you know, so it's all relational. What's, what's going on? Uh, how are things transforming for me? And how, you know, I say daydream because it's all, you can't really um, pinpoint or know after so many, after so many years, you kind of just forget. You don't know what to expect when you get out. 
One of the things that I really love about Grant as an artist is that his work is constantly evolving. It doesn't look the same now as it did a year ago or a year before that. Initially, he was really focused on unpacking the subconscious because he'd spent so much time inside. So you'd see a lot of text, a lot of symbolism in his work, and now he started to take that lens and turn it towards the natural world and focus more on the outside. I am really inspired by the outdoors. I can remember at the last uh, prison I was at, there was thick woods, it was, in, it was up, uh, you know, up north a little bit in Michigan. There's thick woods right behind the fence, you know, and every time you go out and walk the yard or do whatever, it's just like, man, it's, it looks beautiful, but you know, you can't touch it, you can't go in there. Uh, and that's one of the first things I did when I got out, I met up with some friends, we were walking in the woods and I got to touch the trees. And and I think it's all about that, that, that little space of reflection that you can get. So it's like, for me, if that's what the most potent space is that I can put myself in for a good reflection, uh, that's what needs to happen. If I applied to school, art school, um, not really knowing why. I kind of had this romantic notion that I can just go on continuing painting houses or whatever, or do the, whatever construction I can get, and be up in this attic studio painting stuff, and then why, you know, I'm an artist making things, why do I need to have that academic training? But it was kind of a, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted that college experience, I wanted a degree, I wanted something that on my resume besides the whole prison thing. Going there, I quickly realized that the critique of the shared work of different artists is it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing. It's a, you have different eyes looking at stuff. Um, people that have a strong input, something that's, you know, uh, constructive. And it's a, it's, a, it's a really fertile grounds for experimentation on things. It's, there, it's, it's nice to, to have people get excited about something you make or to just, just enjoy it on any, any level. It makes you feel like you did something right. I guess that's kind of, you know, that's a, that's a good pat on the back, I guess. Yeah. What's up guys, I am here with Corey Hampson who is the owner here at Habitat Galleries. How you doing Corey? I'm great DJ, how are you? I'm doing good man. So tell our viewers out there a little bit about the history of Habitat Galleries. Habitat started in 1971. We're the oldest and largest gallery devoted to studio glass in the world and we're located right here in your backyard, Royal Oak, Michigan. I love it. I'm, I'm, first of all, I've been around this the galleries here and I've just been like a kid in the candy store, mouth open the whole time. How do you choose pieces to be featured in here? Well, that's the most difficult part. So we have this evolutionary change with the show every year. Usually about 100 artists from 35 different countries participate in our annual event, the longest and oldest annual exhibition for Studio Glass in the country is hosted in Royal Oak. So we have to choose different artists every year and I'm telling you it is very difficult. We get thousands and thousands of people interested in glass sending us the information. We have to take a look. There's a big long panel. We're sitting there discussing, arguing, but really it's the most innovative artists, the most innovative work that we're looking for. Yeah. And that's a very tough decision, DJ. Yeah. And how long has this place been around? Uh, well, we started in 71 for nearly 50 years we've been in the business. My father started it early on in the 70s and at the time artists were making bowls and vessels and, and paperweights and it took a few years to kind of get off the ground but as materials started to become more accessible, mm -hmm. colors started to become more readily available mm -hmm. and ideas started to really just branch out yeah. and, and artists started to start casting work and lamp working and using different types of materials to create sculpture. Mm -hmm. And it really changed the face of studio glass as we know yeah. it. Yeah, and so you, you guys hold auctions? Like, how's that we, work? We host auctions. We do about three auctions a year, developing kind of a secondary market. A lot of people are, are after uh, 
the deal, mm -hmm. and uh, the auction mm -hmm. provides that deal for people. Okay, and so what's your favorite part about working here at Habitat Galleries there, Corey? Oh my God, I gotta say, you know, passion is a is a kind of a funny thing. It's it's uh, when you're around somebody or something. That, that excites you, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's catchy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I'm around the material and around these artists working with the material, it's exciting, you know, some of it's done really hot and it's at the end of a blowpipe and these personalities are immediate, you know, they give you what, the, what you want. And others, you know, they're very conservative, they take time, they grind, they polish, they work with big machinery, others cast work, which take time. Mm -hmm. And so there's all different types of personalities, not only the artists, but also the collectors, the most fascinating people in the world are involved in this industry. Okay, glad to hear it. Well, I've been inspired just being here for the short time I've been here today, Corey. <laughs> All right, so Corey, so where can, how can people come here and check out this place? What time is it open? Is it open to well, the public? Well, we're located at 4400 Fernley Avenue. That's between Coolidge and Crooks off 14 Mile. Mm -hmm. Uh, hours, 11 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday. We're open to the public, we're completely free. We want you to come out and, and get energized. Mm -hmm. We want you to come out and learn, yeah. learn. Because that's really what this is about. It's more about the exposure. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're hoping that you come out and do. Absolutely, or get inspired like I've been today. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you talking to us, man. Appreciate it. All right, now let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. Growing up with autism, Grant Monnier tore paper to calm his anxiety. Now, as an adult, he uses paper scraps to create artwork that is inspiring. Here's his story. When you think about it, art is important to everyone. It lets us express our feelings. For example, if an artist was angry, he'll throw paint onto the canvas. If he's calm, he'll stroke paint onto the canvas. And if they're happy, like me, they'll tear paper and put it onto the canvas. My full name is Grant Dean Monnier, and I am known as the Eco Artist. I take recycled materials like paper, calendars, magazines, posters, and puzzle pieces, which are my signature mark, and even jewelry, beads, and wood. And I make art out of it. Anything I can use to recycle and create beautiful masterpieces with. Basically, this all started because I have a lot of anxieties because of my autism. Tearing paper and working with paper was a way to soothe those anxieties. He was six years old when I found out. He had high anxiety, beyond normal anxiety, it was extreme. He would perseverate on TV uh, shows. He could repeat them over and over and over for hours, for days. <laughs> I feel relaxed as I work with paper, and I feel connected to something bigger. You can't get rid of autism. It's just something you work with. You just gotta make it your own. With my autism, I'm hyper-focused when it comes to stuff. 
once I start seeing things in my head, I just started working with it. I tried paint at first, but I just didn't have the feeling for paint like I did when I was younger, so I decided to try paper instead. Puzzles are the, are the logo for autism if you've seen the autism logo. Not to mention the puzzles have a lot of unique colors on them. And plus, a lot of people throw them away. If they're just missing one piece, what's the point of having that puzzle, right? I just I take a canvas and I sketch what I see onto that canvas. Once I have that sketched out, then I, I need to find the materials that I need. I need to find the right colors for certain areas, and once I have those, all I need then is glue. Next, I need my paintbrush so I can stroke the glue onto the canvas, and then I take a piece of paper and then place it right onto the canvas. And I keep this process up. A simple piece would take about a week to make, and a complex piece would take over a month to make. Oh, that greatest feeling I have is when I sign it and it's done. The way I've seen this outlet, this process impact Grant from the age of four to now the age of 21 has been, I guess, a mother's dream to watch your child grow, especially when they live with autism. Can they grow? Can they go through the process? Can they transition into an adult? You know, they say, you must be a proud mom. I don't even know if proud's the word. Maybe I'm in, in awe of what he does and, and how he touches people. It's amazing. Because of my art, I get a lot of opportunities to go to places that I've never been before, like New York City, Washington, D.C. All the friends I get to make, the celebrities, the politicians I get to meet, like the mayor, the governor, and Congress. There's just so many things that are enjoyable about making eco art. Because of my eco art, I had a lot of doors opened up to me. But what I want to do in the future is open up a gallery for those who have special needs, like me. Even though you can have a disability like autism, you could still turn it around and find the good inside of it and make it positive. Whether you're on the spectrum or not, if you have autism like me, if you're not, don't worry. And if you just if you just feel different compared to everyone else, that's fine. Remember, it's not what we can't do that makes us different. It's what we can do that makes us more. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank Habitat Galleries for having us out here today. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.